Hi everyone, I'm Philip. Ah, I'm by the way, I wanted to say thank you to Leslie for organizing Google Summer of Code or kicking it off for a long time. Uh, because I was a student back in 2007 and yeah, I'm sorry, I'm I'm old. Um, and yeah, <laughs> kind of. And I was a, a mentor a few years later. And this year we were an organization, or I was the org admin for the first time. So um, it, I did survive, and it influenced me quite a lot, I guess, um, and pushed me to where I am. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so I want to talk about. Open source is a business, um, and I guess this might be a complicated topic here because um, depending on where you stand on this issue, like some people are more business friendly than others, but we'll see where we can take this and you just violently agree with me or disagree with me at the end, and we'll see. Um, so I don't think we need to discuss what is open source. We'll, we'll just accept. Um, I stick to the very simple definition from opensource.org. Um, a common problem that you see is something like this. Uh, that lots of people want well-maintained open source products um, and then when you ask like who wants to contribute fixes all the hands goes down and when you ask like who wants to be a maintainer everybody is gone which is not necessarily the crowd here but oftentimes this is what you see out in the field and probably you you, you felt something like this um, and then there is this side of people who say like um, we do a lot of stuff by paying people for example Puppet, uh, or the founder of Puppet said that 98.5% of the code put into Puppet was, pay was done by people being paid by him. Uh, and this, of course, raises a different question, like how do you even make money? Um, and I think you need to be aware that open source is not a business model. I think that open source is kind of the better model in any possible way over closed source software, except for making money, um, which might be unfortunate, but true. Uh, there are various ways how to make money out of open source, uh, and we'll dive into those. Um, for us, it's more of a, a distribution model than a business model, but it's how to get software out. So this is my currently CEO, Shai. Um, I work for Elastic, and we talk about, or I try to talk about the stuff that we do. And why is that kind of important? Anybody knows that logo? It's Datomic, the data store that was close to um, uh, closure, and it is out there, but it's not one of the open source databases that was started recently. And it's I always feel like closure um, or the atomic have been in a very interesting space, but because they don't have a truly open source version of their software, their addition or adoption was always hampered strongly. Like they're very much a niche. Uh, Nobody is really using them on a wide scale because, well, you have this free version, but it's only free for your one year, and then you would need to pay to get updates. So kind of the atomic was stopped as that because, well, the distribution model doesn't work that well because they don't have the open source distribution model. They try to commercialize too much. Um, why am I talking about that? Well, I work for Elastic. We try to do better than that. And I want to break this up into different parts. So these are all open source products. I don't want to talk about them too much, uh, but this is what we do in that space. Um, if you search on any of these sites, your search goes through our software, but I don't think any one of these companies is paying us. So these are just open source users. Um, anyway, where is the money? Um, because our company, we're more than 1,000 now. I think we're 1,100 or so. It changes so quickly, it's kind of hard to keep track. But that's a lot of salaries to pay. So where is all the money coming from? Um, I want to kind of break this into three parts. The strategy, the struggle, and maybe the success. We'll see if we get to success. Um, so the strategy, um, the first thing that a lot of people do is like offer services, uh, like support, consulting, training, certification, whatever. You have some additional things around your open source products. Um, Canonical doing Ubuntu, they are one of the players here, but probably the first one everybody thinks about is Red Hat, obviously. Uh, they've been very successful with the support model. Um, that was their uh, quarterly revenue growth over the past few years, which has been impressive that it has been growing and growing and growing for so many quarters. Um, everything for them changed lately, so I'm not sure how, we'll how that will change over time, uh, but that is how Red Hat has been doing their support model. Um, you could then say like, okay, this is easy. Where's the problem? Like everybody just replicate the support model, right? Why might that not be a great idea? Um, so one of the problems of support or services around it is kind of the ease of use. What if you have a 
product that is too easy to use. Will anybody buy support from you? Or what if your product has good documentation, whereas bad documentation? Like, when will you need support? And it's kind of like a place you don't really want to be in, that you have to fight, like, um, our product is too easy to use, or our documentation is too good, so nobody will pay for support, so we're doing bad as a business. And I don't want to say Reddit is doing that, um, but I, I it's just a general problem that uh, you have, like, these different factors of where you're being pulled, so you might not want to do that. Um, the next thing is normally renewal rates. So somebody is using your product, and if it they're using it successfully, they're probably learning what they need to learn over time. And after two or three years, they might say, okay, why do I pay you? Like, I know everything, uh, product is working well, why, why should I keep paying you? Uh, so oftentimes, renewal rates are very bad. Um, probably not on the operating system level, but on a higher system level. People are sometimes not so keen to still keep paying. Um, and then you have the competition from people just doing the support or just doing the consulting. Because if you develop the open source product and do the consulting, you only have like 50% of the billable hours of somebody else. Because if you only do the services, you will always be cheaper and undercut somebody else who just does the open source work plus that support work. You will still know the product better, but a lot of people just care about the price. And if somebody else comes in and says like, oh, we're half the price or a third cheaper, people are very keen to jump on that and say like, well, we can get the same thing more or less for the same price. And it's also not a great place to be. So another approach would be open core. Like you have the open source base product to get people onto the product, and then you have some extensions to, if you want additional functionality, you can just pay us to get those features, uh, which is MySQL has been doing that for a long time. They had also had this dual license. Uh, if you wanted to embed your product into something, or if you didn't want the GPL in your products, uh, you could uh, buy or pay them to get rid of that license and use the dual license. But they also have more and more, now with Oracle, commercial extensions to get more features. Another thing is Mapar, uh, the, the Hadoop platform, uh, which have like three different levels. I think M3 is like the open source version, then there's M5 for higher availability, and M7 is the next level for more efficient things. And it's kind of like they have the base open source version, but a lot of people require the commercial version to actually use that. Uh, so that's what they're doing. So what are the problems in that area? Um, it's kind of like somebody could basically freeload on your open source work and then compete with you while you do kind of the hard base work, um, which is something like you do the open source work and then you have some subset of functionality you put on top that you try to commercialize. But what if somebody else tries to compete with you just on that commercial part? So you keep all doing all the, let's say, 80% of the open source work, and then you want to commercialize on 20% of the features, and somebody else could just compete with you on those 20%. And obviously, they will again be e able to offer a cheaper product because they just compete on a subset of your features. And that's kind of very annoying when somebody does that, but it is part of the open source ecosystem that people can do that. Um, then, of course, you have the drivers that less and less stuff gets into put into the open version and more and more stuff goes into the closed version because, well, you need to make more money and then it's kind of like, where do, does your focus shift? And at some point, you just keep your historic open source features and everything new is going into the commercial version, which is also not a great factor. Um, and then finally, if you try to commercialize something like security or automation or monitoring of your product, if people or if cloud providers offer that as a service, you don't really need those services anymore because, well, somebody else can just use the service and provide that and then nobody needs to pay you for that anymore. Um, cloud services. That's one of the other big things how people can actually make money. So WordPress is one of the big examples here. So WordPress.org is where you get the open source version. WordPress.com is where you get WordPress as a service. I'm not saying you should use WordPress but a lot of people do that, and a lot of people get WordPress from WordPress.com. So that's working very well for them. There's also Sentry, for example, which does um, errors and stack trace collection, and then can show you this error happened 100 times and affected 20 users and whatever. Um, they're fully BSD licensed. I think the only thing that is not open source for them is their billing module, which they use for their cloud service, but everything else is open source. And they just run it better than you could do it yourself and charge little enough that you don't really want to go anywhere else and just let them host it for you. But you could totally could if you wanted to. Um, the problem again is that somebody could come in and basically steal your lunch and 
then disappear with it, and you are left hanging there. Um, so the first problem is if you have a big commercial or a big successful open source product, cloud providers are very keen to host your stuff and provide it as a service, and they're normally not very good at giving back to you. Um, I really like this quote that uh, open source was not really made for um, someone else to do exactly what you've been doing and then take the money, which is, especially with AWS or those other cloud providers, very annoying that they're very good at that. They just take whatever you have been doing, if the license allows it, they will just run it as a service and cut you off from that revenue stream, which is legal, but probably morally questionable. Um, other approaches of how to make money are a bit more obscure, but there are some interesting approaches. Partnerships. Um, anybody knows how Firefox is mo or Mozilla is making most of their money? Yes, they have the default search. I think it's only in the U US where you get Yahoo as the default search. And Yahoo is paying a nice sum uh, to be the default search. I think it was for five years and it will end relatively soon. Uh, but Yahoo paid a good amount of money just to be the default search in there, um, which is an approach that you will not be able to do for lots of other projects. But for Mozilla, this worked out really well. Um, the problem is it's very domain specific. You probably cannot transfer that to too many other things. Um, another thing are that you could live off donations, which is appealing because it doesn't really compromise your vision. It's just like people love my product and what I do so much, they will just give me money. Um, for example, the Wikimedia Foundation is making a lot mo of money out of, well, donations. But they're again in a very unique position because, well, they're one of the most widely used websites and they can just add this banner, please, banner, please give us money. Um, so for scaling and also planning, this might not be ideal for lots of other projects. Especially for the planning, you want to hire three people to do your development and you don't really know how your dona donations will develop. It's very hard to hire somebody if you don't know how much money you will be making because you basically rely on the goodwill of others. Um, there are people who are very happy with that Patreon, donation, whatever model, uh, but there are also lots of other projects which didn't work or for which it didn't work out that well. Um, and it's pretty much like pointing to businesses which got lucky one way or the other. Some got lucky with Patreon and donations but others failed with that model. So while it does sound very appealing because you don't need to compromise your vision, it's definitely tricky to get kind of sustainable funding. Um, you could do certified partners. Anybody knows a model where or a project that is doing that? Moodle, the, the e-learning platform, they have on their website, they basically, because you often need to customize Moodle, they have a list of partners on their website, uh, which says like, if you need a customization, go to these partners. And to be listed there, you actually pay the product. Um, but you need a kind of a commercial ecosystem, otherwise you won't be able to have these partners on there. Um, you could use ads. Anybody knows the, uh, the business model of Adblock and how they approach that? Yeah, they, they do allow ads. Like they have this uh, campaign uh, for you can have non-annoying ads. And if you're a small site, you just need to ask them to do that and they will do it for you. But if you're a larger player, um, I think like Google ads, you have to pay them to allow those ads. So their business model is they say like, I think 90 points or 90 something percent of the ads on their site that are shown are being shown for free, but if you're a big ad network or player in that space, you have to pay them to be whitelisted and you, you have to have non-annoying ads. So if you have some blinking, sounding, whatever thing, they will not allow that. But if you have something non-obtrusive, uh, they might allow it, but you might have to pay, which is again an interesting business model, but only translates to certain areas. And also the question is like, what is even an acceptable ad? And then you're always like ha trying to push the boundaries there. Um, you could sell merchandise. Um, for example, OpenBSD has a store where you can buy OpenBSD merchandise. Uh, but I think revenue-wise, you probably only get enough for service probably and not to pay people full-time just, just from swag. Um, you could do bounty and crowdfunding. So for example, there was this, this was a couple of years ago, uh, Cataclysm was a game that Somebody did a crowdfunding campaign to say like, hey, I will write this game. And actually this crowdfunding funding campaign actually delivered that game because lots of other things kind of fail, but that one delivered the game and it worked out really well. Uh, so that seems to be a winning model. The thing is, especially if you have bounties for features or specific features, um, 
where does your product develop? Into which direction are you going? Because oftentimes somebody wants something for a very specific use case that doesn't make sense for the broader project. But if they pay you, you have this very strong incentive to add something that you think is not a good thing in the long run. And while you get some money today, it might kind of kill your project little by little by having lots of different features that you need to maintain in the long run that don't make much sense overall for your project. It just sets weird incentives at some point. Um, or you could have sp corporate sponsoring. So for example, um, AWS, these are the open source products of AWS. Um, and the problem here are what are your incentives? Because if you look at that list closely, so these are the 15 open source products that or projects that AWS is doing. And the ones that I have left in here that I haven't uh, fuzzied, uh, those are the ones which are just there to talk to AWS services. So 10 out of those 15 services are like their CLIs or SDKs, just to interact with them and do nothing else. So while this is open source, this is probably not the open source that is generally helpful. Um, yeah. Okay, so struggle. Now that you know how you could make money, what could be the struggle of making money actually? Um, so the first one is kind of a philosophical one. Um, do you contribute upstream? Which is kind of a very important question for open source development. Because if you're not, you're not really part of the o open source ecosystem. And then you're just living off of others. Which is kind of taking me to the next point, which is you have kind of, I always, or I see that you have three groups of people using your software. You have contributors, which are awesome because they give you back features or bug fixes or open issues or say, hey, this is missing in the documentation. Like they contribute actively with your project. You have users, which are just using what you have. These are great because, well, you want to write stuff that is being used. And then you have, I would call them the consumers who are taking more out of your ecosystem than they give back. Um, or you, you could also call them kind of the vultures because they, well, they're just waiting to get stuff out of you. Um, for example, Amazon is pretty high on that list. Uh, they're very good at bashing open source software in general, but they're also very keen to take whatever is available for free and then turn it into a for-profit service on their end. For example, uh, Presto was developed by Facebook in the open, and what you get at Athena to crawl lots of data for you on AWS S3, um, that is basically Presto that was developed in the open and they have productized that. Um, or for example, um, Microsoft Azure, they have this Redis Azure cache, um, or Azure Redis cache, that's the proper naming, um, which is obviously kind of enraging the uh, Redis community because th it's not the Redis Azure cache, it's basically Redis provided as a service or Amazon is only calling it Elastic Cache and then Redis is somewhere as an afterthought. And for Elastic Cache on AWS, you can get Memcached or Redis. But it's basically providing a service and really cutting you off from the revenue stream for that, but also like circumventing a bit the naming and just making it appear as if it was a product from that cloud provider. Um, speaking of Redis, um, we had the commons clause yesterday already. Um, so Redis was a GPL licensed or the Redis Labs modules. You need to be specific. Like Redis, the server is still BSD licensed and it is remaining under the BSD license. It's only about those additional Redis Labs modules, which are at the bottom. Redis Search, Redis Graph, Rejson, etc. Um, and they were their license was changed from the AGPL to Apache 2 with the Commons Clause edition, um, which is yeah, not the greatest edition. Um, because the addition that the Commons Clause is giving you that basically you cannot sell the software. And sell could be doing consulting around it. It could be you offering as it as a cloud service. Uh, so it's kind of like taking Apache and then taking stuff away, which is kind of a weird combination in my opinion. Um, it's not open source anymore. And they just deemed that AGPL was not strong enough. Somebody else could, they could still open source whatever they have been doing. Um, so they wanted to have a stronger clause than the AGPL. Um, unfortunately, Commons Clause is super confusing. ACC is kind of something else for most people. And then you have this Apache and then you have Commons Clause at the very end. And what might also be very confusing, there is a commons.apache.org, which is something totally different. It's a Java library that has been around for a long time, but it might be your first association if you see Commons Clause Apache. You might just assume, oh, it's commons.apache.org. So I think the entire naming and everything is very confusing and rather unfortunate there. Um, 
And it doesn't help if your uh, investors put out an opinion piece where they say some rabbit open source wonks. Um, this didn't give them much credit either. Like that statement was taken pretty badly um, by the community. On the other hand, there's also the other side. Um, obviously, the cloud providers who have been getting stuff for free are very keen on pointing out that this is not the right way and open source should be done properly. And properly basically means that as a cloud provider, you can just get stuff for free and offer it as a service. So there are different interests at play here where you need to be careful like who is actually saying something and what is their goal and what is their interest? What are they trying to reach here? Um, Redis itself, as I said, is staying under the BSD license. Unfortunately, their communication wasn't that great. Um, so Salvatore, the author of Redis, he had to put out two blog posts uh, that Redis itself is staying under the BSD license. Um, so yeah, I get the idea why they did it, but maybe they could have done it in a better way. Um, by the way, does anybody know uh, the license for Neo4j or the commercial version of Neo4j? The graph data store? Like they have a, a grand mix of stuff. Um, so they have GPL version three, and then they have stuff under the AGPL, and they have added the commons clause just in case now. So that that's in there as well. And then they have other closed source stuff as well. So they have like pretty much all the license, not, not all the licenses, but they have kind of a wild mix of licenses in their repository. Um, just to be sure, like putting on as many licenses as possible to stop others from doing things. Um, and then there's MongoDB. Did anybody see the recent discussions about MongoDB and their licenses? Which also didn't go down that well. Now, they used to be, they used to have the server was AGPL licensed and their clients or drivers were always Apache licensed, which made sense. But now they replaced the AGPL with that server side public license, the SSPL, which they just created. Um, and this has this, uh, one clause in addition to the AGPL, which is offering the program as a service. So this is uh, the explicit clause against uh, cloud providers. Uh, what they did, um, is that still open source? MongoDB, so right now it is officially not because it's not an approved license. Uh, they're trying to make it an o OSI pro approved uh, license. Um, not sure how that will go or how long that will take because they just had the feeling that AGPL was not strong enough anymore. Um, something that was very unfortunate about that was that they said like, as of today, we're changing the license and the next patch level release will be under a new license, which is not great if you don't have like a widely known license, but just something that you came up with yourself because nobody had any time to review that from a legal perspective. So if you're a bigger corporation, you probably have to review a new license and it take might take weeks or months until that is internally approved. Up until then, you cannot even get the next patch level release, even if there was a security issue or anything in MongoDB, because nobody knows what that license actually means and if you can use it internally. So the timing I found very unfortunate. What the proper way would have been to say like, okay, the next minor or major version in two, three, whatever month will come out with this new license. Until then, everything stays the same so everybody can prepare and decide what to do. But obviously, this was not really the goal of what MongoDB wanted to reach. And then you have things that might go even worse. Um, does anybody know that logo? No Microsoft users here. This is Cosmos DB. That is the database that Azure is pushing for everything. It's the multi-model thing that can do everything. And what they did is, since they didn't want to touch MongoDB since it was AGPL licensed, they basically took the APIs and they just provide the MongoDB APIs to the outside, but they have their own data store in the background with that. And that's kind of what might happen to you if you have a popular product, but you try to shut others out. Basically, somebody takes your APIs and provides the APIs as a service and runs whatever they want behind the door um, or behind the scenes. Uh, and then you're really cut off from the project, which I don't think is like a big win for you. Um, next problem that you might have is users. Everybody loves users, but everybody hates users at some point as well. Um, we, we had, some time ago, we had this very nice conversation where somebody was complaining that um, nothing was done on an open source product. And what is the open source, uh, what, I what is the, the common question that you need to ask when somebody posts something like this? Do you want to get involved in the product? Um, we did that. Um, and the answer was, of course not. Um, which we found kind of, yeah, that, that's an interesting approach. Uh, and then we, we had kind of a, a longer discussion um, 
And you know, if you're unhappy with your open source product, you're entitled to your zero dollar refund. Uh, that Mike McQuaid, he's the guy doing homebrew, the, the package manager for uh, Mac. Um, and I think you always need to apply this um, when somebody complains in a weird way. Um, and then somebody else from the community stepped in and says like, oh, that's a joy and burden of open source. And then it was like, yeah, but there is a company. They, they have money. Like They just need to hire more people and they're lazy. And we don't agree that we were that lazy. Uh, so the colleague who was maintaining that as part of their his role, like he was only like spending one day a month or so on, on that part, which was unfortunate, but that was the way he had to handle it. Uh, he explained why it was a bad idea. You don't have to read it, it's more like to, to explain the situation in case anybody looks at the slides afterwards. Um, in the end, we did hire somebody to fill that role. And I think we hired the, the Ruby developer from MongoDB away, which is, it's not probably not helping their pro efforts, but um, that's how, how we solved that. And Emily uh, is now maintaining our Ruby uh, stuff. So you can see um, the last spike in things was her fixing lots of stuff. And also for our Rails integration, we deprecated part of the, the Rails integration. Um, so we got rid of the active pattern. Uh, yeah. Uh, we switched out to repos the repository pattern and active records was deprecated. That's basically the solution and she, she pushed it through and it's going better now again. Okay, so money. How does money change open source products or what are the problems? You obviously have the conflict of interests. Open source view versus commercial view. Um, anybody remembers that the problem Cassandra and Datastax had? So Datastax was kind of the main driver behind Apache Cassandra, the open source product. But it was also weird because Apache normally requires at least two entities to be behind the project, but it was only mainly uh, Datastax. And the documentation and I think the downloads and everything were on the Datastax site. It wasn't, they were not on the Apache site, but on the Datastax site. And at some point they had a rather ugly divorce because Apache said like, this is not the way we want to operate. Um, now, um, Cassandra is kind of in a weird space where you have Apache Cassandra and then you have Datastax Cassandra. And to switch out from one to the other, you actually need to dump out all the data and re-import it because Datastax has done some internal optimizations, so you cannot reuse the internal data anymore, which is not that great. Um, but sometimes if two parties are fighting, somebody else comes in to take over. Anybody heard of Scylla? It's a so Cassandra and Datastax, they are written in uh, Java. SkillaDB is kind of the C++ re-implementation of Cassandra, and it's supposedly much faster. Uh, and they are trying to take over from there. And while the two are fighting, they want to offer kind of a better product uh, and also avoid any confusion. But basically, there are three players in that one ecosystem now. Um, and then you have the problem, venture capital accelerated development versus who is actually making the decisions. Uh, which always have back and forth. Um, anybody remembers CouchDB? Back in 2010, it was kind of the hottest NoSQL data store that everybody wanted to use. But then for various reasons, probably also because they didn't really have the funding to push forward that much, it kind of stalled. And it took them years to have that uh, uh, CouchDB version 2 version, which supports uh, sharding. And I think it project the project almost stalled for five years or so. And Damien Katz, who started it, also mo moved to a new company, and that happened to be Couchbase in the end. And I feel like Apache CouchDB was a good project, but it just didn't have enough resources to push through in like this high growth NoSQL time. And then Couch Couchbase basically went in and took over from them uh, because they had enough venture capital to push through. Um, there are ver various other reasons why that happened, but that's part of that. You might have hobbled a uh, product versus a starving company, which might look something like this. Anybody uses InfluxDB? At some point, they made all everything that is not on a single node, like scaling on your vacation, is now commercial. Um, so basically, as long as you're limited to one node, you can use the open source version. Otherwise, you cannot. Then there was RethinkDB, which was like highly loved. But they didn't find a valuable business model, and then they shut down. I think the code is now uh, with the Linux Foundation, but there haven't been any proper releases in over a year. So that product kind of, while it was very open and loved, it kind of died along the way, which is also not that helpful. And then there's Docker. Docker is still around, but I'm always wondering how, how long, because who is using Docker? Probably everybody, or almost everybody. Who is paying Docker? 
very few, if anybody. Um, okay, then you have open code, uh, closed source uh, products. There is CockroachDB, which is also a data store, which is hi having like new relational database approach, uh, like but very resilient, uh, which has an open code base. You have even their commercial code is on GitHub, and you can see the code, but you need a commercial license to use it. And the opposite is, for example, Dynamo DynamoDB, which is only available as a service on AWS, where you have no idea what is going on. Um, and then there are some projects trying to play tricks. For example, there is SQLite. Does anybody know? So they, they are not even open source. Uh, they are um, on under Creative Commons, I think. Like no attribution required. You can just fork the project and do whatever you want. Yeah, sorry, pub pub public domain. Yes, uh, right, public domain. Um, their code is in the public domain. Um, do you know how they pro provide or pro protect themselves for people not really doing that? Yes, they don't accept. They they have that statement that they're open source but not open contribution. Like they don't take pull requests, or they say like if you do it, submit the pull request, they might take the idea but rewrite it entirely. But how they stop you from actually forking the product and redoing it somewhere else is that everything is in the public domain except the tests. There are no tests available. So you could fork the product, but you have no idea if you change anything, what you break or don't break. And so technically, it's kind of an open source product, but you kind of cannot really fork it or do that. And it's actually kind of common. I found that in Juke, which is like a Java database abstraction layer for uh, databases, or Flyway, a database migration tool, also from the Java ecosystem, they've taken the same approach. Like you have the open source product, but their tests are not open source. So nobody can really fork the project and take it away from them because as soon as you change anything, you don't have any idea what is happening anymore, uh, which is kind of that trick side. Okay, so quickly success. Um, I don't want to say that business is required because probably you would not like that. Business is definitely optional for open source products. And there are lots of open source products which don't have any business side and work very well. Sticking to the database side, because that's kind of where I come from is, well, for Postgres, it's obviously working. But some more recent projects also made a very conscious decision. For example, Envoy, the service mesh proxy, whatever, uh, which is coming out of Lyft. Uh, its founder um, said, like, well, he could have started a company, but he didn't really want to do the company or start the company. He wants to keep it as an open source product, and he has enough corporate sponsors that they keep doing it like that. Um, also, business is complicated. Um, and Sometimes people are not that happy that while when Microsoft puts any piece of code on, on GitHub, everybody is saying, wow, Microsoft is so great now. And if you're an open source company and one piece of code is not on GitHub and not open source, uh, everybody shouts like, how could you? Uh, so it's kind of like the expectation is also kind of a problem. Um, and maybe it's time for an updated model which MongoDB showed. Uh, so there is this opinion that maybe you need for the cloud provider ecosystem you need something that people contribute more back, um, which could be. Um, the problem with that SSPL that I mentioned earlier is that I think it's kind of like going further than the other licenses. So you have the permissive licenses, you have the copyleft uh, licenses with uh, have reciprocity, and then SSPL is kind of going further because what SSPL requires you is if you provide MongoDB as a service, you need to open source all the code how you provide the service. The problem is MongoDB has its own cloud service, but they don't open source their code for that. They are basically, if you're using MongoDB, then you need to open source your orchestration tools, but they don't do it for themselves, which I find kind of a weird approach. Um, there was recently this, this questionnaire of like, what with that license change, what happens? And basically what it looks like is that 49% of people don't care that much, 49% of the people might migrate away, and 1% of the people need to become a paying customer because of that change. So basically it looks like, it's not the maybe not the exactly right numbers, but it is kind of the idea that you would trade 1% more paying customers for 49% of your user base, which I find kind of a weird trade, but that's what MongoDB seems to be doing. Um, and I had this very nice ad, friends don't let real friends use relational databases, which was up in San Francisco some time ago. Um, you could also say like, friends don't let friends use non-open source databases, which might be MongoDB then. Anyway, um, I don't want to go into our story too much, although I'm pretty much out of time, I guess. Um, we have this, we have open source, we have free stuff, which is not open source, so if you're on AWS, you can't get it. That's kind of our protection against AWS. And we have paid features for on-premise users or our cloud. Um, 
all our code is open now. Um, so basically, previously we had Apache license code and then Elastic license code in a private repository. Everything is in one public repository now. Uh, so you have the Apache license code and code you can see, you can file bug reports, you could even, op even open a pull request. Um, but you need a license to use that in production. Um, we do offer training and consulting, but that's very small because it doesn't scale in our opinion. Um, we do provide it as a service, and we also have like an orchestration layer to provide it as a service on-premise. Um, and we have like solutions built on top. That's kind of the, the thing that we have. And finally, um, we have a swag store as well. So if you remember OpenBSD, they have a swag store. So we also have a swag store, um, which is the Elastic Shop, which I don't know who came up with that. Um, but if you want to have stickers, I have free stickers with me today. So you don't have to buy the stickers. Um, I'm not sure. Do we have time for questions? Or do we take a uh, violent disagreement in the break? Sorry? Sure. Then come to me afterwards um, to complain or to agree. Thanks a lot. <laughs>